We change directions now to look at an American artist whose career has spanned some 30 years. He achieved fame when he was only 23. He set the standard for abstract art for the last 30 years. His endlessly evolving styles and techniques have defined movements and have defined movements in art and sometimes have defied them since his stunning debut of his black paintings when he was only 23. As I noted, he has not only influenced what we see in art but challenged our perceptions of art. He is just back from the opening of his latest exhibition in Rome, and he joins me tonight to talk about a remarkable international career and his latest forays into the world of architectural design in Dresden, Germany, and other places. I'm very pleased to have Frank Stella here. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Now, we're not going to talk about fast cars, which you like also, and racehorses, and a lot of other things. I, I, do, I want to look at, at a career. Uh, from, from Andover, you, were you introduced to art way back then? Uh, yes, I did. I did a lot of painting there, actually, but, um, and, you know, it's one of the things that you want to, I suppose you want to tie. It, it, it was important, and it, it made probably the biggest difference in my life, but uh, it's not just the school. They did one thing, which is typical of what you might call well-prepared schools or elitist schools. The materials that you worked with were free. And it was the biggest thing in my life. If you went to paint after hours, uh, you went to the closet and you took out all the paint that you want. Yeah. Now, it doesn't sound like a big deal. Uh, but uh, if you look at art schools, the conventional art school, and what goes on with art students and people who want to paint, is they measure the amount of paint that they use. And everyone talks about how expensive it yeah. is for a tube of cadmium red or what it is to buy supplies. But when the supplies are given to you and you're allowed pretty much to use them as much as you want, it makes a difference. It, it gives you, what, free form to do what you want to do, and, and you, you're not limited by... Well, yeah, it, it, might, it teaches you to press to the limits, because the first thing I did was abuse the privilege. So I would put a lot of paint on a piece of cardboard that was shellacked, and then if I didn't like the way it looked, I just scraped it off and threw it in the garbage. Well, that was okay for a little while, but then the director, Bart Hayes, came around and looked at what was going on, and when he saw, you know, $75, $80 worth of cadmium red every day in the garbage can, he started to get a little hysterical, and they started talking about, you know, what you had to do with the material. Yeah. Then on to Princeton. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. sound like much of a progression, does it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then, did you know what you wanted to be? No, I really didn't. I really liked painting, and it really was a kind of life. It wasn't really a secret life. It's what I did all of the time that I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do, which was, you know, be a student, go to school. I loved going to school and being a student. I like learning. I like trying all kinds of things. And uh, I thought about painting and that I would have some kind of career, do what everybody else did, and, uh, you know, you paint like on the side. Your mother wanted to be your lawyer. She wanted you to be a lawyer, did she? Right. Yes, that's right. <laughs> How did you get? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you were there. Were you influenced by, say, abstract expressionism then? Or were you influenced? I really was, yeah. I knew about uh, Klein and de Kooning. And, and the New York, the heroic school of New York painting was everything for me. It's really what I looked up to. And it's really what I wanted to do, but I wouldn't admit it to myself. Yeah. So then after Princeton and all those influences there, who else influenced you? Well, my teachers at Princeton really influenced me, uh, Stephen Green and uh, William Seitz, and they were very helpful. I mean, and they all said the same thing. The basic message that they gave is that if you really are interested in painting, go to New York and don't go to art school, do it. And so you went to New York and uh, early on to when you were right out yeah, of Princeton. Yeah, but it wasn't, it wasn't exactly like that. But I did go to New York, but you I went to New York apartment. only because uh, I, was going to, I was facing an, an induction exam in September, so I had a, a two or three months that I thought I could go to New York and do really what I wanted to do, try it out, uh, you know, paint. And I lived on Eldridge Street, and uh, it, was, it was pretty good. I worked a lot. And when did you go begin to shift in your own head in terms of what you wanted to do and what you were painting from sort of this influence of abstract expressionism to what's now been defined as a kind of the minimalist and the black minimalism, period, yes, yes. the minimalism. Right. Uh, well, I painted like everybody else, and I wanted to be an abstract expressionist painted, and, but I was working on some paintings, and I began to paint them out, paint over them, and things started to happen. And when I looked at them, it wasn't that I was trying to make them different from anything, but something just started to happen, and I pursued it uh, in a kind of way. And when I saw it, I realized that I had uh, you know, in a way, outperform myself. I really was close to making what I really wanted to do, which is make real painting. And I felt very confident, and I simply pressed ahead with it. Somebody came to see it and, and put it on an exhibition, one of 16 no, or something. No, I saw it. I you mean, saw it. <laughs> yes. I saw it when I was doing it. Yeah. And uh, so then uh, I, I began to make paintings like that. And then I, I went around and, and talked to people and looked around, and some people came down to see them and things like that. But I felt I had something that I could ask people to come and look at. I yeah. guess that was yeah. the main difference. You knew it was good? I did. I did. 
I really right. did, yeah. Take I, a look at this first slide. This is representative of that period. This is the marriage of reason and squalor. 1959, this came. Tell mm -hmm. me what it is. Well, it's a, it's a painting of uh, black enamel paint that you can buy on Canal Street for $1.59 a gallon. And you can buy the, the uh, ca uh, canvas cotton duck uh, nearby. And uh, you stretch the canvas and you uh, make a sort of sketch and you, you, you put the lines on it and you paint it. Uh, that's the way you do it. Uh, the hard part probably is getting a title for it. And that I, I really couldn't do by myself. I needed the help of Carl Andre. Yeah. That was one of his titles. Uh, the, the Marriage, marriage of Reason and Squalor yeah, was one of his yeah. titles. And it's not, it really was about what you were talking about before on the program. It's not so different from that's the way it was here in, uh, in New York. And, uh, and uh, that's the way it still is, you know, 35 years later. In some ways, uh, you know, it's, people say, well, those were very depressing paintings. They were all black. They were about depressing things. And I think they were uh, depressing. And uh, on the other hand, you know, that's something, you know, it's about a kind of black romanticism of a young man uh, in the city or something, but that's the city that you see. But and you still see it. Yeah. I mean. When you look at the length of your career over the 30 plus years, as you were 23 when that, that uh, mm -hmm. first hit, I guess, in right yeah. around that period, yeah. and first drew attention there, you started small and contained and then have sort of spread out. A lot of people, when they look at their career, go the opposite direction over a span of a career, do they not? They become well, more some simpler. Try to, they become to simpler things. than they do. Yeah, yeah. But you know, there are a couple of things. I mean, there's one what I did and there's one what everybody else did. You know, I was one of many and I, and I still am. I think that the whole uh, scene in a way or the whole generation and everything that's happened in the last 30 years has been expansive. And so I think I expanded with it and I think it's going to be a big problem for all of us now. I mean, you know, it may start to contract, but you know, things changed. America didn't have a visual culture. And uh, something happened in the beginning of the 60s, and it wasn't because of the quality of the artist, maybe partly the energy, but something caught on where you could make an image that people would react to. You could make those kind of black, uh, sort of nothing images, and then people would at least react to it. Instead of ignoring it or not even notice it, they did make a big deal out of it, maybe a bigger deal than it should have been. After that 1970 exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, you know, mm -hmm. which was all about minimalism and all of that, and they said it defined it. Did it define it for you? Was it some a, a defining exhibition for a beginning of something? Well, it, it it ended an era for me or a way of thinking. But I mean, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't feel that involved with the. But I mean, the terminology is not so important with the minimalism. But it was a it was a big thing to be able to have a body of work within 10 years that you felt was worth looking at, that From you had done something. To 70, yeah, 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 yeah. I really felt that I had done something. I had done in a way, you know, what I'd hoped I'd be able to do and what I'd found as I, as I went along. I, I worked with the ideas that I had. And I think it was a big turning point for me. It was, I mean, it was harder to start all over again in 1970 than it was in 1958. Alone and in you, York. in fact, started all over again in 1970, in a Well, sense. I did. You began yes. to move somewhere else yes, in a I different did. direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where was that? Well, the, I didn't know what the direction was, but the direction turned out to be into, instead of painting a painting, I ended up building a painting, uh, building something that you painted on. But it was basically a different way of constructing painting and thinking about it. And what made you come to that? What caused well, you to come to that? Uh, some of the th ways I had been thinking about painting, but I mean, I guess it was uh, uh, what happened, uh, the way I started to look at the imagery that I was interested in. Uh, very simply, I was making drawings. Uh, um, uh, I got very nervous the night before a, a meniscus operation on my left leg, and I got, you know, I pretended I wasn't worried about it, but I guess mm -hmm. I was because, uh, you know, they bring you into the hospi hospital sort of early, and from about 6 o'clock at night until about 3 in the morning, I made nothing but drawings. I made 44 drawings, uh, you know, in six hours or something like that. And uh, they were, you know, they were a surprise to me, actually. I mean, they were about all of the kinds of things that I had done, but they were very different. They went in an, uh, a different direction. All they these added, drawings. Yeah, the drawings added detail, yeah. in a way, to the, my own sense of structure. And then when I finally got out of the hospital, I had, nothing to do, I had nothing but the drawings, and I started to look at them, and I realized I couldn't paint them. Uh, they were really plans for something to be built and then to be built up, and then I began to work in, uh, you know, treat them dimensionally and work in yeah. from, really evolve from 2D to three-dimensional structure that I then painted on. Okay, let me take a look at the next, okay. the next slide we have here. This is, uh, you define it for me, what we're gonna see. 
Oop, it's Dresden. You jumped ahead. Oh, they oh that's okay. okay. No, no, it's good. No, it's I don't good. want. I, I just. I, yeah, I, they, I don't want them to do that. Just tell them to go back to where they're supposed to be. Go back yeah. and do this in order as we we're supposed to do. Okay, don't well, jump it's ahead. Just like I, I want. Oh. Let me. It's like go ahead. a lecture. We have to get into this. Like, okay. Anyway, yeah, this is a detail from. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, from a painting called Chakura. And what's interesting about this painting is that it's actually not very far from what we saw from Dresden. Right. Uh, this is what I did after the stripe paintings, uh, yeah. after you saw the black painting, and there were lots of other paintings, banded paintings, minimalist paintings like that. And this is very much like the paintings that I made in, uh, or the drawings that I made when I went into the hospital in, uh, in uh, 1970 or whenever it was. But anyway, the basic part of this painting, I still think that this painting is as good as anything that I've ever done. And, uh, you, you really know, these do. are, yeah, yeah, if, if not better. Uh, the ideas in this are ideas that I really couldn't deal with at the time. After I made these paintings, I went into the protractor paintings and did other things that really couldn't, I couldn't exploit these ideas. But I think that uh, the basic form and the basic thing that happens here, which is the relationship of the triangle to the kind of squarish rectangle, is it's a kind of force. You know, they do f uh, fit together. They move into each other, which is not such an uh, unusual idea. But the way in which they move together and their ability to to react to each other and the sense that you have that you might be able to catapult or spring the triangle out. This is something, a way of thinking about the motion in painting that really is a way of, of keeping things alive and uh, I think it's the right kind of direction uh, for abstraction. Okay. And so, When did you, because I want to get this in because it's important to get some sense of all that you have gone through because if there is nothing else about you it is that you've taken you've taken huge risk in your career, you have opened new doors, you're pushing the boundaries, you are always changing. I mean, that is a defining quality about your work. Yeah, after the fact. <laughs> oh, so, you know, you didn't know you were doing it at the time? or you? No, and I think it's not so different from what other people do, too. I mean, is we're part of what goes on, a part of the kind of dynamic, the kind of organism that is here in the city. I mean, it's what makes American painting great. I mean, it may be, I mean, I like the part, and the driving part for me is abstract painting. But the uh, painting goes on in the city, and it's what makes New York and uh, the kind of thing that's happened here since the Second World War so vital and so great. I mean, I'm a part of it, and I can do what I do because of the circumstances, the kind of support the whole what's here. All right, look at this. I want to do a couple of things here. This is from the Indian Bird series. Tell me what's happening here in this evolution of an artist. Roll, show the next slide. This is uh, number three. Because yeah. this is, represents a whole different thing for you. Think about the comparison of this versus what we have seen. Go ahead. Okay, you know, again, to me it's not so different. It's a background and the forms are acting on the top. In some ways, what you can't see here, it's a little hard to see in the in yeah, the, in the thing, it, it is the cage justice, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. But anyway, it's a kind of cage form, yeah. and the forms float on top of the cage, and they're floating out to you in space. So it's a really a kind of projection of the idea. You have one, but one thing has changed, uh, which is true. But there are other. I mean, and and the the change, the rhythm, the idea of how the paint should travel and how the forms should act is in some ways actually this is more conventional uh, than the slide of what we saw before. This is more like what painting has always been. Uh, uh, treated in a kind of relief format. You've been influenced by now by some old masters. They have said something to you, whether it's Rubens well, or Well, I didn't, I didn't, I, I did this before I knew I was influenced by the old masters, but it's true. He <laughs> did influence <laughs> <laughs> All right, next slide comes from the Moby Dick series. What does this say to us? This is 1991. Here. Right. Well, this, I mean, this says to me that I, that, I, that I sort of did it. I mean, whatever I started out with and whatever my ideas were here, it seems to me that they come together. And a lot of the things that maybe we saw in the Indian bird yes. piece before, the rhythm, the, the movement, the way the things were coming yeah. out at us, here it, it, they're more uh, integrated. Everything really goes together. And this, to me, is both like an advanced and a conventional painting in which everything happens the way it should, and yet it has the power to project its sort of ideas and its image. I mean, it's sort of, to me, for me, this is abstraction made real. Yeah. Were you trying to say something at that time, and I don't want to read too much into this, about where you thought abstract art was and where it wasn't and what was wrong with it? Well, you know, one of the things in Moby Dick that, that's really obvious, and, and one of the things about the whole story and everything, is, is you know, it's a voyage, but uh, like, you know, you go around the world to see. And I think there's the link uh, between seeing is knowing. And I mean, that's become more and more important about, you know, we're more concerned with the way we see and about things and what we know from what we see. And I think that this, uh, the, in this kind of painting and in the whole series with Moby Dick and the whole idea of the painting, this link of, uh, of, of the, both of, of, of seeing and knowing is what's really important. What caused you to go to sculpture? 
Well, you can see it pretty clearly. I mean, mm. walking off the wall, at some point it's going to fall off if right. you make it heavy right. enough. So there isn't, there's not much choice. And I guess, uh, you know, you in the end... You wanted to work with metal. You've always had some, say, a kind of yes, engineering... Yeah, I think there's one other thing, too, that's really important, which is that uh, with the wall pieces and the relief pieces, it, it's uh, incumbent, uh, it's sort of, you have to paint them. And one of the things you can do with sculpture is let the material speak for itself. So you don't need an applied surface. And it, there's a kind of freedom in making something and being finished with it. I, I mean, I, I must say I love sculpture. From that the point process out. for you, though, is you do it with paper and, and, I mean, you really do. You have a concept and an idea. And we put the model together, yes. Yeah. But we don't, but now, I mean, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's late. After 30 years, I've learned to improvise. So a lot of, and even in an improvise with a crane. So we really can make big pieces. Uh, that, that are our, that are improvised. I want to show quickly two pieces. This is what the chapel of the uh, the, cab, the cabin A have been pit. Yes, oh. right, 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 right. And that's a good example. There are small pieces. Those are right. small relief pieces below that are cast in stainless right. that were made in paper. And then the piece uh, above is a piece that was made for that that were made at scale. Now where is that? Uh, that's in at the foundry in Talix in Beacon, New York. Yeah. And uh, we had a lot of snow this winter. It really looks beautiful. <laughs> I then architecture. Frank, right. Philip Johnson was here the other day, uh, and I don't know if you know about this, but he talked about you. I said, what's going on? Somebody told me that he said yes, yes. <laughs> you know, this, the, the piece that you showed is what he liked. Yeah. Well, look, I, I do Dresden very quickly for you. Yeah. Uh, it's a project. We were asked to do something, but it's in a very important location in the city, and uh, it's as though you were building on, say, uh, on uh, uh, 59th Street. Uh, uh, right in the park and someone said okay this is your land you can do what you want here and naturally if you started to do something there everybody would have something to say about it and uh, it, there was a purpose in in our design we were asked to submit a design and we did and the purpose of the design was to to really think about architecture. Now, did the city of Dresden ask you to do uh, no, this? The, 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 the Ralph Hoffman, right, exactly. uh, uh, yeah, uh, they wanted to build a Kunsthalle. He wanted to give a Kunsthalle to Dresden. He's a New York collector. Uh, he's a Cologne collector. He uh, lives in Cologne yes, as well. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. But, but the idea is that the basis of architecture as we know it in an urban setting is a kind of urban geometry. And you talked about minimalism, and you, we all know what it is. And this kind of geometry, we have to do something about it someday, and we may as well start now. I mean, we have to put movement into the urban geometry, and we have to do it for a couple of reasons. It has to be both green, we have to have green movement, and we have to have the movement of the buildings. We have to have something you know, uh, commerce and its way of doing things, its geometry and its rhythm, they have to be there. That's the life of the city. But that's the artery. You have to have another form of circulation, the culture and maybe public work with, with whatever is going on. And that has to be in the city too. Mm. And it has to have a form. It, it needs an image. It has to have a way of expressing itself. And the imagery that we've used here in Jesden, which is basically curved forms and shapes that, uh, uh, you know, look slightly futuristic, these are really the shapes that come out of, you know, Central European expressionist architecture. This is really German architecture of the 1920s. Why is this so controversial then in Dresden? Well, and why uh, the, the put, mayor I, and some uh, of right. their other the painters and artists it. got and Actually, he's a nice guy. Okay. But the real, op uh, uh, and when we brought it to the public, uh, the, the city council voted uh, uh, 70 for me and 30 for the mayor, so he lost. So we have a mandate to use, uh, to, to do our project. But the land is owned by the state of Saxony, and the prime minister of Saxony, who, who many people call the king of Saxony, yeah. is against the project. And he has said that he won't allow them to build anything there unless it's Bauhaus. And they have to, he wants to yeah. get rid of me. And too. they also want to rebuild the cathedral that was, was yes, bombed they out do, in the yeah. war and a lot yeah. of other things. Yeah. Last slide here is the Prince of Wales Theater. I want to show this because this is an extraordinary mural uh, in this theater, and that's not yeah, it. No, that's the chapel. That's, that's the chapel okay, of the Holy Ghost. Go to number eight, guys. I know this is not easy, but go to number slide number eight, and you'll see. There okay. you go. Okay. This is uh, the Prince of Wales Theater in Toronto. Yeah. This is in Turin murals, in which you actually designed it. Yes, we did, yeah. And then other people are... Yes, we hired students and uh, professional sign painters to work up on the ceiling out there, on the scaffolding. Yeah. And then the... Uh, but, but the, this is uh, the rest relief, of the museum. Yeah, the relief, this is yeah. not the mural, folks. Yeah, yeah. Th these are the balcony fronts, yeah. the murals that are cast. Uh, but those we made in the studio, and then they were cast and put in there. Where are you headed? Well, uh... I mean, what's going on in... in I mean, obviously... You, it, well, I'm working on the, the, uh, the architectural projects, and I'm working on the mural painting. And I guess uh, that's the way I'd like to go. I mean, I'd like to work with the uh, new things that we're working on. What are you proudest of? What's made uh, the most difference to you in this career in art? 
well, I guess I could be like everybody else and say I'm sure I'm proud of it because it made my mother happy. But I mean, I guess I'm <laughs> I'm proud of it because uh, you know, uh, in New York. Uh, I don't know. It, it brought me to New York, and I must say that as terrible as it is, I still feel comfortable here. I found a home in a way and something to do. So I feel that's the point. And it that has I like. constantly been evolving. And it's evolved in a sort of a straight line for you. Uh, this this. No, evolution. you go up and down, back and forth. I mean, there have been a plenty of low points. We didn't get a chance to. No, we uh, didn't. Uh, but to, we got right the there. Depths, yeah. But, uh, but abstract there. art is alive and well in your in Frank Stella's judgment. Yeah, it's what I live for. Yeah. And right. I hope to make Very well, it. speaking of what you live for, guess what I have here? Look at this. This is also what you live for. <laughs> you recognize this? Yeah. Yeah. And who is this? Oh, that's. Uh, um, one of the great uh, Hashim, uh, yeah, Hashim Khan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, but he's cheating. Have you noticed that racket <laughs> handle is way too yeah. long? <laughs> he's yeah. only 80 years old. I suppose he's allowed to do yeah. that. Yeah, well, you know where I got this photograph? Uh, no. Yeah, I got, well, I, with some of our friends over at Payne Weber. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's Hashim. He's really wonderful. And he ha always had a lot yeah. of tips. Uh, we, there are a lot of stuff we need to talk about, and we haven't, and the, the okay. movements, and I hope you'll come back, Frank. It's great okay. to have you here. All right, thanks a lot. It was oh, fun. Thank you very okay. much. Frank Stella, we have a lot more to talk about with him. Oh, stay, stay with me one second. But uh, we'll be right back, and KT Oslin is here, and we'll talk about um, her music, best known by 80s Ladies, a song that she made famous, uh, recorded uh, and made famous years after she had written it. We'll be right back with KT Oslin in just a moment.